Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm aware of the fact that it's uh, Friday evening and uh, you could be listening to jazz, having dinner, or having fun, but here you are, um, to Mr. To me, and I uh, feel the weight of responsibility here. Uh, so I'm going to try and inform and possibly entertain you over the next uh, half an hour, 45 minutes. I understand that we've already had a fairly comprehensive introduction to uh, the topic of my talk this evening, which concerns epigenetics and evolution. And I hope that uh, what I can uh, tell you about uh, will shed a little more light on this subject. So what I'm going to do is to uh, start off uh, by talking about, let's say, the basics of evolution. Some of you may think of this as being information that you know already. In English, we have an expression, teaching your grandmother to suck eggs. So I hope that you don't feel that you are grandmothers being taught to suck eggs in the first few slides of my talk, but it's necessary to give you a little context, as it were. What I want to do then is to frame the question that I am posing, and then uh, to answer that question uh, with some description of what we understand about epigenetics. So first of all, you should understand that I'm a molecular biologist. And for a molecular biologist, nothing in biology is credible unless you can link it with mechanisms. And so the theme running through my talk this evening is going to be the understanding of mechanisms. And that has been the mission of my scientific career, has always been to try and understand mechanisms that underlie phenomena and then to uh, extrapolate from there in terms of one's thinking about the potential consequences of the mechanisms. So, to start then, what do we know about evolution already? So, evolution, Darwin's grand idea, his big idea, uh, it requires three things. And the first of those things, of course, is that the characteristics of an organism should be heritable. They should be passed from one generation to the next. Of course, Darwin was completely agnostic about mechanisms, but he did sense that, and he indeed generated experimental data showing that uh, characteristics of organisms can indeed be passed from one generation to the next. We can look at this in a number of ways, with simple traits such as flower color, we can do the sorts of experiments that Mendel did uh, and demonstrate that uh, the uh, trait is transmitted from one generation to the next, either as all or nothing. So if you cross a coloured flower to a non-coloured flower, in the first generation all of the offspring will have uh, colour in their flowers. In the second generation, some will inherit the pigmentation gene, and some will fail to inherit the pigmentation gene, and so uh, they will uh, exhibit a lack of pigmentation. So this is um, heritability. With more complex traits, uh, the situation is less straightforward, uh, but again, what we generally observe, for example, with, with parental height, is that the offspring um, of uh, parents uh, and this is human beings, uh, have a height that bears a relationship to the parental mean height. So what we can infer from this is that there are many factors influencing the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the height of the offspring. So indeed, uh, as we know, uh, a requirement of Darwin's big idea, heritability of traits, is satisfied. The second component uh, of Darwin's big idea is that within a population um, there should be variation for particular traits. And actually this was an idea that was introduced to um, uh, Darwin by one of my predecessors as Professor of Botany at the University of Cambridge, this is J.S. Henslow. So Henslow was a uh, botanist, he uh, trained Darwin and was Darwin's mentor, and Henslow's obsession was the variation within species. So uh, this just shows a sample of uh, Henslow's herbarium sheets. 
illustrating one particular species of flower found in Cambridge uh, that indeed there is variation and these are famous drawings from his notebooks uh, showing the differences between pin and thrumide uh, primroses, a phenomenon that he first described. So indeed there is, we know there is variation uh, within populations uh, for uh, heritable traits. I think at this point it's interesting to speculate on what would have been the consequence had Darwin been aware of Mendel's work. We know uh, uh, from later studies that uh, Darwin never actually read Mendel's paper. Apparently there was a copy of Mendel's paper in Darwin's library and the pages were still joined together after Darwin's death. He never split apart the pages and read them. What would have happened uh, to biology in the 19th century had Darwin had the understanding that uh, we have been able to benefit from the understanding of Mendel's work about heritability. <coughs> the next component of Darwin's big idea um, is uh, that natural selection operates within populations uh, so that individuals in the progenitor population uh, which are able to interbreed uh, after uh, selection for several generations are less able to breed and then eventually they give rise to uh, separate populations that are not able to interbreed. So uh, natural selection uh, over a period of generations gives rise to uh, 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 hybridization barriers uh, and eventually separate species. So these then are, let's say, the three essential components of Darwin's big idea. So we all know about this. And the conventional thinking about uh, these three components is that the uh, mechanism uh, of uh, all of these lies in understanding of DNA. And actually, uh, so there's a common phrase in vernacular use, it's in my DNA. I love you because it's in my DNA. Uh, or whatever I support into my lab because it's in my DNA. Uh, so even the man in the street or the woman in the street has been turned into a genetic determinist, a hardline genetic determinist. And so what we're tuned into thinking, a common perception, is that variation in these heritable traits, uh, the substrate for natural selection, is based on variation in the sequence of A's, C's, G's and T's in the sequence of the genes within the organism. So the big question that I'm posing to you this evening uh, is actually nicely summed up for those of you of a certain age who are familiar with American popular music of the 1950s will know of a song by a singer called Peggy Lee. And uh, she had a famous song, which I'm not going to sing it. Is that all there is? Was the question she posed. And so the question about evolution is, is that all there is? Uh, in evolution, is that all is it? It is to do with the variation in the DNA sequence. And what I want to do is to try and persuade you um, uh, in the next part of my lecture that indeed that is not necessarily the case. Let's just review uh, why the idea uh, that DNA is the vehicle of transmitting information is an attractive one. It's an attractive one firstly because within the DNA we know that there is the potential for storing information, there is the genetic code um, that has been well characterized. We also know from uh, the wonderful double helix structure of Watson and Crick um, that um, there are these complementary strands of DNA in which A pairs with T and G pairs with C so that when the DNA is replicated the two strands are copied uh, into exact replicas of each other. So we've got the genetic code with information and we've got the information uh, which can be copied from one cell generation to the next and indeed one sexual generation to the next uh, in the life history of organisms. So this is why DNA is, uh, of course, a key component to um, uh, what is happening in evolution. But I know in your introduction you have reference to um, Ava Jablonka 
and a very stimulating uh, book uh, in which she referred to evolution in four dimensions. So she referred to how when information is uh, uh, stored and transmitted between generations, we can possibly think in terms of these different uh, uh, dimensions. So the first dimension uh, is, of course, DNA. And that's why it works for the reasons that I just described. In terms of uh, humans uh, and possibly uh, other non-human animals, uh, we can also think in terms of uh, behavior and culture as being a vehicle for the storage and transmission um, of uh, information from one generation to the next that shapes um, the uh, uh, types of organisms in the, in the, in the population. Third dimension applied to um, human beings, of course, is symbolism. We can write things down. We can store things, not only uh, written down computer information that is passed uh, between generations. So that is a third dimension to the the fourth dimension that I'm going to be talking about, epigenetics, it sort of looks like ep uh, genetics uh, in that it's associated with chromatin, uh, chromatin and chromosomes and so on and so forth. But it's not associated with changes in the DNA sequence. It's not associated with differences in the order of A's, C's, G's and T's, epigenetics. So what is epigenetics and what are its consequences? Now I'm Professor of Bosnia, so the examples of course that I'm going to give you um, are examples from plant biology. But, as you know, in one of the illustrated in his book, you know, we're all part of the same tree of life. And it is true, and there's a, a big track record for uh, fundamental concepts and processes that apply in one type of organism, in plants, are often true in animals and vice versa because we're all descended from the same original common ancestor uh, uh, that uh, was the uh, ancestor of all living things on the planet. Jacques Monod, the bacterial uh, uh, geneticist, uh, justified his work on E. coli by saying that what is true with Escherichia coli bacterium is also true for elephants. I think he would have had a much better alliteration had he said that what is true for peas is true for people, um, or maize and men, perhaps. And actually the history of biology um, is littered with the examples where fundamental discoveries uh, were made first in plants and they turned out to be relevant um, for uh, studies of more general biology, including food. So the first virus, for example, uh, was uh, tobacco mosaic virus. Um, the first ever description of cells uh, back in the 17th century by uh, Robert Hooke uh, was from a section of cork. Uh, the concept of oncogenesis cancer was first arrived at by these studies of plants. The first notion of totipotency, that organisms, uh, uh, individual cells in an organism have all of the information for the whole organism to regenerate, comes from, uh, uh, originally from work with plants, and so on and so forth. So I hope that you won't find it stretching things too far to use the examples that I will give you with plants, uh, and to uh, move on from those to thinking about um, other types of organisms. So what then is the evidence from plants for epigenetic effects? Well, here's one. This is in Linaria, um, uh, Toadflax. And these are uh, examples that were first described by Linnaeus, actually, in the 18th century. So Linnaeus identified uh, populations of Linaria uh, growing on an, England, uh, an island off the coast of Sweden. Um, where instead of having the bilaterally symmetrical flowers that are typical of this species, uh, they had radially symmetrical flowers. A good friend and colleague of mine, Enrico Cohen, working in Norwich, has subsequently analyzed uh, this uh, phenomenon, and he's shown how the sequence of a key gene, cycloidia, which affects the 
morphology, the symmetrical morphology of flowers, and which determines this trait, the DNA sequence, the A's, C's, G's, and T's, are exactly the same uh, in this plant as in this plant. And there is uh, something uh, that I'll describe in a moment, an epigenetic modification that accounts for this difference. Here's another example from maize plants. And this involves maize plants that were either pale or purple. And there's a gene called B, not very prosaic, but uh, easy to remember, which affects the pigmentation in these plants. Um, what we know is that the DNA sequence actually of the pale gene is different from that of the purple gene. But if you make a hybrid between the pale plant and the purple plant, what happens is that all of the progeny plants are pale. So that's fine, we know that pale is then dominant over purple. But then what is weird is that if you save the progeny of these plants and look in the next generation, all of those plants, even the one that have the DNA from the purple plant in the, in the first place, these plants are all pale. So something has happened to this purple DNA so that it can no longer make the plants purple. And then what is weirder still is that when you take these plants that have the purple gene in them, which is now pale, and you hybridize those um, with other purple plants, and look in the next generation, you find that all of those plants are pale. So something weird has happened to this purple gene, such that it now is no longer expressed. And when you put it into the same background as a purple gene, it switches off that purple gene. This is something we call paramutation. So paramutation is an epigenetic effect. We talk about pale as being paramutagenic. Um, purple is paramutable. Uh, but once purple has been paramutated, it becomes paramutagenic. I hope it's not too uh, sort of complicated for this time later. But what we know is that um, the property of the purple gene has been changed, and um, it now has that, but its DNA sequence has not been changed. So something epigenetic has happened to this. So this is, for a molecular biologist, you know, it's, it's very nice. Um, it, it's a phenomenon that we can work on. And there's a lot of work being done now about um, understanding the molecular basis of these epigenetic effects. And what we understand is a number of features of the mechanism. So I get back, I told you I was a molecular biologist, I'm hooked on mechanisms, I need to understand the mechanism in order to be able to believe the phenomenon. And what we know is that there is a wonderful mechanism associated uh, with these epigenetic changes that has got nothing to do with the sequence of the DNA. It's actually associated with... with uh, a chemical modification for the C residues in the DNA. It's a methylation residue which is added onto the C residue. So these are still C but they've got a chemical modification to them, and they are C. So why is this um, interesting and important? Well, it's interesting and important um, because um, the methyl groups can be added to DNA. Um, so uh, um, uh, we can have establishment of epigenetic silence. Um, methylation um, causes a, a gene to be switched off. So methylation has got information content to it. It can, be, it can cause the gene to be switched off. And the methylation status of DNA is maintained, just as is the sequence of DNA, it's maintained uh, through DNA replication. So if you start off uh, with a bit of DNA, where you've got a methylated C and an unmethylated C, and that DNA then divides, initially the daughter strand um, doesn't have a methylation opposite here, but there's an enzyme which we call maintenance methylation, me maintenance methylation, which adds a methyl group onto the second strand of the, of the daughter strands of the DNA. So what this means then is that this epigenetic mechanism has exactly the same uh, characteristics as the DNA sequence, in that it carries information 
when you're methylated, you tend to switch off the gene. And secondly, you can be copied through re the replication mechanism. So let, then, let's compare um, epigenetic modification, or we sometimes use the term epimutation, um, uh, versus genetic mutations. So both result in loss of gene expression, um, either because the uh, gene is silenced, that's what happens with epimutations, or with a mutation, what normally happens is that the um, uh, protein, the imprinted protein, is non functioning. Both are inherited um, via DNA um, replication or maintenance methylase mechanisms. So they both have the requirement of being uh, inherited from one generation to the next. But there are two key differences about the epigenetic mutations, the epi mutations, as compared to genetic mutations. So firstly, epi mutations can be acquired sometimes in response to environmental stimuli, unlike um, uh, uh, normally um, genetic, uh, much more frequently uh, than genetic mutations. And when I say much more frequently, it may be 10 or 100 fold more frequently um, than genetic mutations. Another characteristic of epi mutations is that they are lost more frequently um, than, or they revert more frequently than uh, genetic mutations. So this epigenetic machinery has many of the characteristics of the genetic machinery, except that it's more dynamic, it's more um, flexible. So what is the trigger uh, of these epigenetic modifications? I think somebody's got a phone call. Um, uh, so it could be that the epigenetic modifications are actually determined genetically, in which case they're not really of interest to us because they're just the same as genetic matter. Um, so those you could say it's in my DNA. Sometimes the epigenetic modifications, if they're just occurring randomly, um, then um, you could say, well, it's not in my DNA, but it might as well it might as well be genetic because okay, it occurs a bit more frequently, but it's sort of random. So that's the second scenario. But the third and the more interesting scenario is that somehow epigenetic modifications can be targeted by other agents, including environmental stimuli. So this would be really interesting because it means that something affecting information and heritability is not in my DNA, and it actually is determined by the nurture, the environment of the organism. So an epi mutation, in this sense, uh, would break down the barriers between nurture and nature. Is that indeed the case? Well, I believe it is. And the reason why I think it is follows from work in a number of different laboratories, but I'll just describe some work um, uh, in my laboratory and others on related topics. And these works follow from some observations that when we were attempting to make genetically modified plants, the results were not always as we anticipated. So there were some very famous experiments done with petunia plants, for example, where you have a petunia plant with purply pigmented plants. You add into those plants another gene in the flower pigmentation pathway, and what happens is uh, you would expect in a simple world uh, that the flowers would become more darkly pigmented. What actually happens is that most of the time they remain the same, but sometimes they, they look like this. So what has happened then is that the gene that is added into the plant uh, is causing is not only being switched off itself, but it's also switching off the resident genes within the plant um, that are associated with um, uh, flower pigmentation. Sometimes you get weird things like this that the authors of the paper refer to as the Cossack dancer pattern. And I hope you can understand why that is the case. Um, so we actually know quite a lot now about the mechanisms associated with um, these types of, we call them gene silencing phenomena. 
So what we can envision is we're looking inside a cell here. This is a cartoon. It's not real, I'm sorry to tell you. Uh, but I think it's a reasonable representation of what is going on. Uh, this is, in the background, the nucleus of the cell. And here we have uh, an RNA molecule from the transgene. So what is happening in that cell is uh, there's an enzyme that recognizes this um, RNA from the transgene as being foreign, and it covers it into a double-stranded form. Cells do not normally see double-stranded RNA, and so they chop it up into small RNA molecules, uh, which initially exist also in a double-stranded form. What happens subsequently is that these double-stranded small RNAs uh, attach to a, a protein in the cell, and they lose one of the two strands, so that the protein is then bound to a single-stranded RNA. And what this RNA molecule can do uh, is to roam around in the cell and it will find other RNA molecules uh, that are complementary through Watson-Crick-based pair. And this protein that is bound to this is an enzyme that degrades RNA. So it, it knocks its target RNA out. Target RNA is then hoovered up by the enzyme that exists in the cell. There's a whole lot more stuff. I, I, I've shown you this just to give you, you know, my molecular biology mechanism obsessed credentials here. Uh, there's a whole lot of other stuff that we know about these mechanisms that links this process with the addition of methylation groups to uh, elements of the DNA. So what we've got here is a process um, that can target um, uh, epigenetic modifications of DNA. I'm going to show you now an experiment, or the summary of an experiment. And I like showing this because I think it is the, um, it is the, it's the most interesting experiment that my lab has ever done in my whole scientific career. And it exploits some subsequent uh, discoveries that we made, which is that viruses uh, feed into uh, this uh, uh, mechanism that I just showed you in the cartoon. So, um, in this experiment, we have a, a virus. We have a virus that is modified so that it carries part of um, a gene in the plant. And the gene that we're looking at here is the traffic light gene. Uh, so I don't, I don't need to go into the technicalities, but when this gene is on, uh, in this assay, um, the leaf looks green, and when it's off, the leaf looks red. So we took some plants and we infected them with these RNA molecules, with these viruses. And then we asked, what happened to the traffic light gene that we're interested in? What happened was that the traffic light gene got switched off, and that was sort of interesting. But in some of the experiments that we did, what happened was, um, that the traffic light gene was switched off not only in the plants that were infected, but also in the next generation, and then in the next generation, and in the next generation after that. So what had happened was um, that by using a virus, using an RNA molecule, we had initiated an epigenetic change in these plants that is transmitted from one generation to the next. So for a molecular biologist here, we've got, you know, an understanding of a mechanism that can account for heritable epigenetic changes, epigenetic changes that persist from one generation to the next. So what is going on in this whole phenomenon here is that we've got the virus, and we've got the target DNA, the traffic light gene. And what is happening in the infected plant is that the traffic light gene is getting modified, it's actually getting methyl groups added to its cytosine residues so that it is silent, so that it's switched off, so that you see redness in the plants. And this um, uh, silencing of the gene persists 
uh, between cell generations and actually between sexual generations, between from one generation of the plants to the next. So we've got two things here. We've got the establishment of gene silencing, uh, establishment of the epigenetic mark, and we've got maintenance of it, which is independent of the presence of the initiator. So this is an effect that is, once it's started, it goes on. It's uh, information that is initiated in one generation of the plants that is transmitted uh, between the plant generations. So we talk about how we've got separate initiation and maintenance components to the um, epi mutation, epi, the epi mutation event. So what does this mean? What does this mean for organisms? Well, what it means is that there is a mechanism in plants um, involving RNA um, that has the potential to induce heritable changes. So what we could imagine is that there are RNA molecules being expressed in a plant uh, that are resulting in the introduction of epi mutations that are maintained from one plant generation to the next. And because they're affecting genes, uh, they will uh, be subject to natural selection. So they could be part of the evolutionary process in exactly the same way that the genetic mutations could be part of the evolutionary process. And what we know is, at least from work on plants, is that um, stress, so when we uh, subject plants to various stress treatments, uh, that this can initiate these epigenetic changes uh, that persist from one generation to the next. And in some instances, uh, this is stress treatment, um, uh, let's say heat stress, which causes the next generation of plants uh, to be somehow uh, more tolerant of heat stress than were the untreated parental plants. So this is an example of how the environment can influence the properties of an organism being transmitted from one generation to the next. So work that we've done in the laboratory recently shows another um, aspect of this, and this was work where we were interested in hybrids. There's been a lot of work done, and there's a lot of interest in hybrid organisms. I mean, let's think about. I mean, hybrid or hybridization is the essence of evolution. I mean, hy hybridization is necessary in order to go from one generation to the next. We know from many examples, in actually in both plant and animal biology, uh, that when we make a hybrid, the offspring are not always um, uh, resembling in all respects the parental organisms. So the sort of Mendelian type of uh, conventional genetic properties of, a, um, of the hybridization process are, are broken. We have examples, we refer to these traits as transgressive traits. They transgress the limits established by the parents. Here's an example from tomatoes. So you can have one wild tomato which produces small green fruit. And you can have a cultivated tomato that produces medium-sized, medium red fruit. And then uh, the observations are that in some of the offspring of this hybridization, the fruit are larger and redder than were the parental plants. So what this is telling us is that somehow um, the process of hybridization is releasing information that is heritable uh, and that is manifested in the subsequent generations. What my lab uh, and other labs has done uh, is indicating that these uh, transgressive phenotypes, these examples of extraordinary properties of hybrids uh, are often associated with the RNA type of processes that I've just illustrated to you and epigenetics. So what this is telling us is that hybridization is not only an important process uh, in evolution because it brings together new combinations of genes, but it's also important because what it does is it initiates, through epigenetic mechanisms, new heritable patterns of gene expression that are transmitted from one generation to the next. So hybridization is actually bringing something out that didn't exist before, and it's doing this through, as I say, the types of epigenetic mechanisms that I've been describing to you. 
So the predictions then that one would make from uh, epigenetics, uh, uh, following from these uh, individuals, is that there should be heritable variation between individuals in a population, between varieties of plants, or between um, possibly um, animals, um, that is associated with epigenetic differences rather than genetic differences. The evidence for this is now uh, quite good in plants. Uh, uh, there is some evidence um, in humans uh, and possibly um, in other animals as well. Another prediction is that the environment um, will have heritable effects uh, on the properties of organisms. So the environment in one generation uh, can uh, influence the properties of organisms in subsequent generations. The evidence for this from plants, as I say, is quite good. Um, in lower animals, for example, Cigaraptitis elegans, worms, um, there's good evidence for this type of stuff. Uh, there's also evidence from um, people as well, although being, as I say, a molecular biologist and obsessed with mechanisms, I would like the examples with people to be followed up with some uh, analysis of mechanisms. But this is just a summary of what we know about um, the, uh, th this is one example from uh, Morris Penguin's work, who studied uh, populations in uh, northeast uh, Sweden. And he observed, uh, for example, that paternal smoking uh, was uh, associated with uh, body mass index uh, effects on sons, but not on daughters. Uh, there were effects, according to his analysis, uh, of the paternal grandfather's uh, food supply uh, that was transmitted to grandsons. And he's also uh, had evidence, generated evidence, uh, that paternal grandmother's food supply uh, can be associated with the granddaughter's mortality. So there are a number of studies along these lines indicating that the environment um, can um, have an effect on the uh, properties of later generations. So then, you know, in response and in closing, uh, in answer to the Peggy Lee question, is that all there is? Um, the answer is, I think, in terms of um, uh, changes that occur uh, from one generation to the next. It's not only dependent on mutational changes happening um, to DNA, uh, but there's also um, evidence of the potential and indeed of examples of epigenetic changes uh, being introduced um, from one generation to the next. And I think the significance of this is really if one is trying to explain how it is um, that the diversity of life can have come about um, uh, in such a relatively short time. So uh, it, we can go back, let's say, to the origin of flowering plants. So this is Darwin's abominable history. How can it be um, that in the 150 million years um, uh, since the uh, emergence, the evolutionary emergence of flowering plants, that we can have such enormous diversification. There's some estimates are that there are between 100,000 and 200,000 species of flowering plant. Uh, mammals, um, there are something like five to 10,000 species of mammals that have been observed uh, that have emerged over that time. So uh, perhaps part of the answer to this is that um, not only has the evolutionary progression uh, being facilitated by mutational changes, by genetic changes, uh, but in many respects it could have been accelerated perhaps uh, by the involvement of um, epigenetic changes. And I think that uh, we don't necessarily have to think of uh, the Marx giraffes here um, and to uh, be thinking in such crude terms about the involvement of um, epigenetic characteristics. But I think that the uh, potential for epigenetic mechanisms to accelerate evolution uh, in certain environments may have a profound effect on our understanding of um, evolutionary mechanisms 
as we get to understand more about this whole process. So I think with that, I'll stop and I'll be very happy to take questions if there are.